start recording. <clears throat> yeah, so I am happy to introduce Jason Said, and today we're going to talk about SSV polynomials. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming. And thanks again, Slava, for inviting me. So uh, like you said, I'm going to talk about the alcove block formula for SSV polynomials. So before I get into anything, let me tell you what these are and why I'm mentioning them at this seminar. So the idea behind SSV polynomials is they're, they're this generalization of McDonald polynomials that depends on a new positive integer n. And for those of you who study Whittaker functions, this is the metaplectic degree n. Uh, but what's interesting about them is that if you take this polynomial, which depends on a whole bunch of new parameters, and you let the Q parameter go to either 0 or infinity, and the Gs specialized to certain Gauss sums, you'll recover the metaplectic Whittaker functions. Uh, specifically, the notation I'm going to use in this talk is coming from the recent paper of Brubaker, Bushumis, Bump, and Gustafson. So all Whittaker function notation will be from there. And more specifically, we can state what the relationship between these objects is. So the SSV polynomial in the Q goes to infinity limit can be related to the Whittaker function where this W prime is one. And if instead you use W naught, then you can recover uh, the Q goes to zero limit. I'm not quite sure about all the other values of the Whittaker function. That's currently open, but it, it might be known to Sahi, Stockman, and Venkateshwaran, but not to me. But let's get into some background and talk a little bit about SSVs, and I'll try to sketch how this is proven at the end. So what we'll do is we'll start with some background. I'll remind you about how affine vial groups work, and I'll explain alcove walks. Then we'll go into SSV polynomials, and I'll state my alcove walk formula which is really an imitation of what Raman Yip did in the McDonald setting. Then we'll talk about some consequences. And finally, we'll use some of those consequences to see what Whittaker functions are doing here. So first, let's just set the basic notation. And today, I'm just going to think about type A, the GLR theory. So we'll fix some positive integer R. And we'll consider the Euclidean space r to the r. The epsilons are the standard orthonormal basis. And I'm using the notation that I think everyone else uses. Phi is the finite roots. Phi plus is the positive roots, et cetera. And note that for my weight lattice, I am taking the integer points of the Euclidean space. So this is the GLR weight lattice. We'll use the notation W sub zero for the finite vial group, the group generated by reflections in the finite groups. And I'm using this notation because really I'll be talking about the affine vial group most of the time. So that one gets the letter W. As you probably know, uh, the finite vial group is a Coxeter group with the generators being the little SIs, the reflection through the alpha Is. And we have the type A braid relation. We won't really be using the form of these relations, but it is important to the alcove walk formula that I'm working with Coxeter groups. And next, I can introduce affine versions of all of this stuff. So we're going to take the Euclidean space and extend it by one more dimension, adding a new basis vector delta. And we extend the form by saying that delta has form 0 with everything. Any questions on anything so far, by the way? I assume this is all the standard stuff. Uh, so then we have the affine notions corresponding to the finite things I mentioned above. So we have affine roots, which is some finite root plus some integer multiple of delta. And here, I'm only interested in real affine roots because I want things you can reflect through. That's really what I'm going to be looking at. So I, I don't care that there are imaginary roots for today. And similarly, phi tilde plus is the positive real affine root. Our new simple root, alpha 0, uh, will be delta minus the highest root. 
And as usual, I want to view this affine space, this extended space as functions on the Euclidean space. So I'll use these angle brackets to denote this affine form. And with this notation, I can define for each affine root a hyperplane in the Euclidean space. So H alpha hat is the hyperplane on which alpha hat vanishes. And S alpha hat is the reflection through that hyperplane. So let's look at a picture. And there's going to be a lot of pictures, uh, versions of this same picture today. So I'm going to take R to be three. And so this is type A2. And I'm going to restrict to a two-dimensional subspace that still has all the interesting information on it. So in this picture, all of the black lines are hyperplanes orthogonal to various affine roots. The, the green one is orthogonal to alpha one. The orange one's orthogonal to alpha two. And the lower pink one is orthogonal to the highest root theta. So that's this. Uh, and of course, a root and its negative are orthogonal to the same thing, to the same hyperplane. But so the way we get the rest of the hyperplanes, the ones that don't go through zero, is we can translate up one unit by putting a delta here. So delta minus theta is shifted up one, and so on. And that's how we populate this whole plane. Any questions about this picture? OK, so then I'm going to construct the affine vial group by just saying they're the reflections through all of these hyperplanes. Although, of course, uh, you can use only the reflections through the alpha i's, and that's good enough. And if you do that, letting little s i be the reflection through alpha i, then this is also a Coxeter group. And the braid relations are like before, except they use this circular diagram. So another way of presenting this same vial group is in terms of translations. So I can let, for each root, uh, each thing in the root lattice, I can let tau of mu be the translation by mu. And then I can concretely describe the vial group in the following way. So it's just the finite thing semi-direct product with all the translations. And I mean, I'm sure you all know this, but you can get away with this because S0 can be written as a translation times a finite reflection. And we have the following nice conjugation relation. Okay, so I think that should be the end of the basic stuff. Oh, a little bit more. So of course, uh, the vial group preserves the integer points of the space. And further, because I'm only allowing translations by roots, by things in the root lattice, I'm really preserving all the vectors that sum to a certain number, right? If I'm just permuting or adding things that sum to zero, I'm never going to change the sum. We also have another action of this affine vial group, this time on the extended space. And this is the way that the vial group is actually typically defined, at least the way I learned it. And I'm going to use the notation s alpha hat star v. I'm putting the star notation because this action comes up less frequently. But this is through the reflection in the extended space. And what's useful about this is that it permutes the set of affine roots. So it's some action that's compatible with this affine action, and it plays nicely on the roots. OK. So now, quickly, what I want to do is take all the affine stuff I just said and repeat it, except this time I'm going to shove an n everywhere. And I'll explain why this is useful in a picture in a minute. So wherever you see a delta, I instead want to force it to only allow multiples of n times delta. So my, my new affine roots, the n affine roots, it's alpha plus n times some integer times delta. 
And the positive ones have the same condition. They're the positive finite roots. And then whatever n affine roots there are that have a positive s. So our analog of alpha 0 is called alpha 0 n. And it's going to be n delta minus theta. For other i's, alpha i n is just shorthand for alpha i. And this seems weird at first, but this is what's going on in the, the metaplectic picture. And I'll, I'll show that. Well, I'll at least show you what I'm trying to do here. So I'm just going to introduce the variant notation for all the reflections. So S i n, if i is 0, then it's the reflection in alpha 0. Otherwise, it's the same as S i. And what's interesting about S 0 n is it's really the same finite reflection and then a translation by n theta. So all I'm doing when I shift all these deltas by n is I'm turning the, I'm restricting to the subgroup that only allows translations by n times the root lattice. So it's some subgroup of the usual affine vial group, but it's also isomorphic to it, of course. So S0n has the same braid relations that uh, with the other SIs that S0 does. So these are two isomorphic groups but one's contained in the other. And that will be clearer to see from the picture that is right here. So if we look at W3, all we're doing is only allowing ourselves to use every third hyperplane. So this one and this one are in the usual setting. These are the reflections through alpha one and alpha two. And then instead of drawing the alpha zero hyperplane here, I don't do that. I instead draw it up here. This is the three delta minus theta hyperplane. So all I've really done is stretched out all of these little triangles, or what I'll call alcoves in a minute. I've just stretched out all the alcoves by a factor of two. Does this make sense? OK. So now I can start to talk about alcoves. So the n alcoves are just the connected components of my Euclidean space minus all of these hyperplanes, where alpha hat lives in phi tilde n. So in the picture above, this is a 3 alcove. And then we have a favorite one, so the fundamental n alcove. It'll be a, a fundamental domain for this action. And it's just the, the space of points that are positive with respect to all the alpha ins. Or if you like a more concrete description like I do, it's the, the ones that have the entries strictly decreasing and the greatest difference is less than n. So this has to do with the finite alpha i's and this one comes from alpha zero n. So for example, here's a picture in the same setting as above that shows alpha 1, alpha 2, oh, sorry, A1, A2, and A3. So A1 would just be up to here because the wall that goes here comes from alpha 0. But if instead I moved the wall here, if I wanted to look at alpha 0, 2, then I would have to allow this larger alcove, and so on. And so then this is A3. So the sizes of the alcoves depend on n in this nice predictable way. And what we can do is we can identify the alcoves that show up in this picture with elements of the n affine bio group. So th this action on the alcoves is simply transitive. So I can uniquely say, that for any alcove, let me just identify it with the element that takes the fundamental alcove here. And in this picture on the right, you'll see some examples. So one is where the fundamental alcove is, S0 is where S0 would take it, et cetera. Any questions? And variants that will be useful to us 
We also have the closed fundamental alcove, just turn those into weak inequalities, and the integer points of the fundamental alcove, the closed fundamental alcove. These will come up in, our, in the indices of our SSV polynomials. We'll be interested in the ones that depend on this set. Okay, and I sort of already said this, but this space is a fundamental domain for the action of the N affine bio group on the integer points. So now I can finally get to defining what an alcove walk actually is. I'm going to take some element of the N affine vial group. I'll give it a reduced expression. And if you're not, not familiar with the Coxeter group lingo, that's just a way of writing it in terms of the generators that's as short as possible. And I'll let this vec w just track the indices that appear because that's enough to determine w. So an n alcove walk of that type, it's a sequence of n alcoves. And I'm going to write it algebraically first, and then we'll make sense of it with the picture. So algebraically, at each step, I either want the next alcove to be the same as the alcove I was just in, or I want it to be derived from it in a predictable way, depending on the next SI that I was supposed to apply. So this J here is the same as this J. And this operation only makes sense when I interpret an alcove as a vial group element. So really, oh, actually I'm about to write this. So if A J minus one is like U times the fundamental alcove, then what I'm really doing is I'm saying that A J would be U times S I J N A N. And the, the reason why this makes sense as something to talk about is that these two alcoves are going to be adjacent to one another. What happens is if AJ minus one corresponds to some element U, when you use the conjugation relation in the vial group and move U past the SI, what you'll get is a reflection through wherever U takes alpha IJ N. So this alpha ij was, uh, its hyperplane was touching the fundamental alcove. And now u takes you from the fundamental alcove to your current alcove, and it brings the hyperplane along with it. So the hyperplane that I'm reflecting over is one of the walls of my current alcove. So let me, let me show a picture for this. So let's look at one alcove walk so that the pictures are nicer. And I'll look at one of type 0, 1, 2, 0, starting at the fundamental alcove. So my w will be s0, s1, s2, s0. So what I can do is I can do an alcove walk where there are only crossings, no folds. So by this, I start at 1, then the next element I'm supposed to look at is S0. It's the next thing in the reduced expression. And I choose to multiply on the right by S0. The next one is an S1, and I multiply on the right by S1, and so on. For each element, I choose to multiply by that on the right. And if you look at the picture, what's happening is I started in the one spot. I reflected over this alpha 0 hyperplane and I end up in the S0 alcove. And then what do I reflect over? It's not the hyperplane corresponding to alpha one, but the hyperplane corresponding to wherever S0 took alpha one. Right, so this is the hyperplane for alpha one. And when I reflect over S0, it takes me here. So that's how these crossings are working. That's, that's where these hyperplanes are coming from and why the alcoves are adjacent. And so if I continue in this way, I'm going to build up a sequence of alcoves. Does this make any sense? Any questions? 
Okay. And while we're here, let me introduce some lingo. So the endpoint of an alcove walk is just going to be wherever it stops. So for this one, it's this element. And so that's S0, S1, S2, S0. And I'd also like to use the notation phi of P to be the finite part of that vial group element. So write it as a translation times some finite vial group element and just take the finite part. And that's uniquely determined if I say the translation goes on the left. And I'm, I'm only introducing this because it'll come up in my alcove walk formula. And I want you to have heard it before. But okay, so let's look at a few other examples. So I could have a case where I have a few folds. So this time I choose not to do the S0. I stay in the same place for my first step. And then I do the S1. I choose not to do the S2. And I do the S0 step. So what this looks like in terms of the picture is I go to the hyperplane I would have reflected over, and then I turn around. That's what it means to fold is you, you choose not to use that part of the reduced expression. And so then I cross this one, I fold at that one, and I cross this one. So here are some examples of crossings and folds. This one's endpoint is S1, S0. OK, one more quick one. So I just wanted to show that you could have an alcove walk end back where you started. They're, they're not all going to have different endpoints. So for this one, I could do S0, omit S1 and S2, and then do S0 again. And I come back to where I started. I come back to 1. And of course, there's always the alcove walk that just reflects off of every single wall and stays put. So there are at least two alcoves that end at 1, or two alcove walks that end at 1. So now I want to quickly introduce a notion of sign for these folds. Every fold will be designated as positive or negative. To do this, I'll first orient the hyperplanes. So for each finite root, I can say that an alcove is on the positive side of its hyperplane if it's on the same side that the fundamental alcove is on. So for this hyperplane, this is the positive side, this is the negative side. And then for every other hyperplane, I can define the orientation in a parallel way. So for this hyperplane, now the positive side is there, the negative side is there, just because I shifted what I did before. And then I can say that the fold is positive if when you turn around, it's because you're staying on the positive side of that hyperplane or negative otherwise, if you're staying on the negative side. So let me go up really quick and show you an example. So this fold here, it tried to cross this upper pink hyperplane. And that is on the negative side of that hyperplane. So I say that this is a negative fold. And similarly, the other fold in this picture is also negative. Let me show a different example up here. So here, this hyperplane corresponds to a finite root. And so this has positive here, negative here. So when I translate up, plus minus, I see that again, my first fold is negative. But the second fold is going to be positive. Because now, the hyperplane I'm trying to reflect over, it has its positive side pointing up. So this, this notion won't be too important, but it shows up in the formula. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned it. Uh, but any questions on this?
OK? So let me scroll back down to where we were. So we just defined positive and negative folds. And I'm going to let ALK n of w be the set of all n alkyl walks of type w that start at 1. In the alkyl walk formula that I'll write down very soon, this will be what we're summing over. We'll sum over all alkyl walks of a certain type. OK, so in order to do that, I have to first tell you what an SSV polynomial is. And I'm going to cite a lot of, of results of Sahi, Stokeman, and Venkateshwaran on the next slide. But first, let me fix some notation. So again, we have a positive integer n. We have parameters q and k, which come from the McDonald polynomials. And then we have these new g parameters, which carry some sort of metaplectic information. We have one for every integer but they satisfy the following conditions. So first, it only really depends on the subscript modulo n. Second, g0, we want to take that to be our parameter k. And finally, gs and g minus s are inverses if s is not 0. So really, we have a lot fewer than integer many. We have like n over 2 many. And to relate this to the notation that appears in the recent paper of Brubaker, Bushumis, Bump, and Gustafsson, uh, their little g is minus k, in, uh, sorry, my g is minus k inverse times their g. And the thing they call v is my k squared. So now we're going to work over the field, which is the complex numbers adjoin all these new parameters. And SSV polynomials will live in the space f x plus or minus 1, which is the space of Laurent polynomials over this field in the variables x1 to xr. Or if you prefer the more formal definition, x to the mu, where mu is a weight. Same idea. OK, so now let's cite some results that will give us these SSV polynomials. And of course, if I haven't said it out loud, this is the SSV. So really, their accomplishment was to construct a new double affine Hecke algebra representation that generalizes the, the usual basic representation in a very nice way. But I'm only going to, to use part of that. So what they did is they constructed certain operators, the Y operators in the Hecke algebra, that act on the space of Laurent polynomials. And these come from this new Daha representation. And what you can show is that these operators are actually commutative with one another, and they're all diagonalizable. And I'll, I'll give a formula later, but I'll call their eigenvalues uh, gamma of nu hat mu, where mu varies. And what SSV polynomials are, are they are the eigenfunctions of these operators. So there's a unique family of Laurent polynomials E mu upper n, where mu is any weight, so that y nu hat acts on E mu by this eigenvalue. So just like the McDonald case. And of course, we need a normalization condition. We say that x to the mu is coefficient 1 in E mu n. Otherwise, it would only be determined up to the scale. And this thing is what I will call the SSV polynomial. And sometimes, depending on how many parameters I'm interested in talking about at the time, I may or may not write them all down. Most commonly, I'll just write emu n. So next, I want to talk a little bit about some examples. But before I do that, are there any questions about this? OK, so let's see. So first, if n is 1, we're just recovering what was already known. We're recovering the usual McDonald polynomial. Nothing weird is happening here. Sort of cooler, in my opinion, is if you fix an n then, and you look at e of n mu, then you're also recovering a McDonald polynomial. 
although the variables and the Q will be raised to the nth power. So for each n, the family of McDonald polynomials sits in here as weight times n. But then we have all of these other things. And our goal is to understand what are these other things. Uh, they're also the ones who first connected SSV polynomials to Whittaker functions, which I mentioned briefly at the beginning and I'll elaborate on later. Another nice result that's crucial to the Alkov walk formula is that if your lambda is what I call small, if it sits in the, the closed fundamental Alkov, then E lambda is just a monomial. And this is generalizing the fact that for McDonald polynomials, E zero is one, right? Raman Yip's formula is built off of starting with E zero equals one and then applying a bunch of recursion operators to get a formula for the McDonald polynomial. Well, it turns out that you can do that for anything in the fundamental alcove. And this is just proven explicitly, just calculate what the Y does on the monomial and you'll see that it works out perfectly. And further, I mentioned a recursion. So there are these operators that I won't have the chance to define, tau i, i from zero to r minus one, that intertwine the e mu's. So tau i takes e mu n to e s i mu n. And I should have defined this earlier, but by this symbol, I just mean is a non-zero scalar multiple of. So the, the point of these last two is that now we have a recursion. I can start with something in the fundamental alcove, apply a bunch of intertwiners to it, and get any SSV polynomial I want. And exploiting this idea is how you get the alcove walk formula. So let me now state this result. First, the notation. So for any weight mu, I know that it corresponds to a unique lambda in the fundamental alcove. And I can let w be the shortest thing that takes lambda to mu. So this yellow box is my setting. w lambda is mu, mu is the thing we're interested in, lambda is the easy one. And then given a reduced expression for w, and this matters. The formula actually depends on the choice of reduced expression. We have the following result. So I'll explain the notation below, but some features I want to point out. First is that we're summing over the set of alcove walks. So we have one term here for each alcove walk. So that'll be two to the L term. So there are a lot of them. Second is the powers of X all have this form. They're all the endpoint of some alcove walk applied to Lambda. So this actually gives us quite a bit of control over what shows up here. Uh, second is that the terms are some product over positive folds and negative folds in your alcove walk. So now let me go down and give you a little bit more of the notation. So I, I know this looks horrible. And so that's why after this, I'm going to go through a few corollaries and try to see how we can understand this. But this phi here is the thing I made a point to mention earlier. It's the finite part of the endpoint. And what makes this really nice and allows us to understand things like Q limits very well, is that this sigma function that appears just depends on K and G. It's just either K, K inverse, or G. And further, I can know what the gamma that appears here looks like explicitly. So you might remember the notation, these are the eigenvalues of the Y operators these appear explicitly in our formula. But we can actually get a pretty good handle on what they are. 
So next, I want to convince you that this is any use at all. But before that, are there any questions? I'm sorry, could you remind me what is K or Kappa? K? Oh, uh, sure. So K is just one of our parameters. So in the notation in your recent paper, V is K squared. OK. Anything else? So there's a V and a Q. Uh, what would the Q be then? So the Q, interestingly, only appears inside this gamma. And it, it appears here. It comes from the eigenvalues of the Y operators. So to make the connection with uh, Whitaker function would be. Oh, would uh, be? So, so in your recent paper, uh, I believe you used, oh, no, no, there is no Q. The Q is the thing that limits away in the Whitaker function. OK, so um, because Q is like McDonald Q, uh, whereas T is like piatic variable T, or maybe that's K now. Right, so, yeah. So it becomes uh, 1 or 0 or infinity? So it'll, it'll be 0 or infinity. And I'll, I'll write that down explicitly in a little while. Okay. Yeah, actually, I guess that's the point. I mean, there's plenty of parameters. But there was no McDonald Q parameter, and now there is. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything else I can clarify? And I assume that this formula recovers uh, the formula of gram and yip. Yes, you exactly. Set n equals one. Okay. Thank yeah, you. actually, it's it's very slightly more general because in their case they only started with e0 equals 1, whereas really they could have started with anything in the, the fundamental alcove like I did here. So your uh, this formula captures a few more McDonald polynomials than theirs did, because theirs depended on e mu for mu in the root lattice, whereas I can do the weight lattice. But they, they knew how to do this. They just didn't write it in their paper. OK, so now let me try to convince you that we can do something with this formula. So the first thing is that this shows that the SSV polynomials satisfy a nice triangularity relation. So I can define a partial order on, the, on z and the r, or if I'm looking more small scale, at the orbit of lambda, by just saying u1 lambda is less than u2 lambda, if u1 is less than u2 in the Bruja order on this file group. And with respect to this order, we get triangularity immediately. And the way this works is let's just remember what we have in this formula. So the powers of x that appear, they all have the form, the endpoint of some alcove walk applied to lambda. Right? All those x's were just sitting in the front. But the endpoint of the alcove walk, to, to get it, all we did is we took a reduced expression for w, and we crossed out some of the si's in that reduced expression. We chose to omit some of them when we folded. And that's exactly what it means to be less than w in the Bruja order. So this is what it means for u to be less than w, is that you took a reduced expression for w, and you omit some of the elements in its reduced expression. So it's sort of a tautological result, but it tells us that the powers of x correspond to some ordering. And this, for example, immediately gives us that these form a basis for the space of Laurent polynomial. But what I find really cool about this result, and it, it's sort of easy to show, but I didn't realize it till more recently, is that actually all of the coefficients in this expansion are non-zero. So I didn't just, uh, I'm not just telling you which things could appear. I'm telling you exactly what powers of x are going to appear in the SSV polynomial. And to see that, we can just exploit the, the formula explicitly. So what I'm going to do is specialize the parameter k to be a number between 0 and 1. And I'm going to let all the g's, just send them to 1. I don't want to think about them right now. All the g's other than k, of course. 
So then if we look at this formula, pretty much everything is positive, right? This is just a bunch of Ks times Gs. K inverse minus K. K is chosen so that this is positive. Same here. So all I have to worry about is these gammas. As long as the gammas are between 0 and 1, then every term in this expansion is strictly positive. And the point of that is that if I have a sum and every term is positive, there's obviously no cancellation. So then when I consolidate terms, uh, nothing will be 0. And to see this, we just use the formula for gamma, just write down what the beta is, plug it in, and we'll see that we get q to some positive power, strictly positive, times a product of k's and g's. And so if you choose q small enough, then this should be between 0 and 1. Right? You only have finitely many of these gammas to deal with. You just figure out what number this product is and just choose, choose, to, ah, choose q close enough to 0 that it's less than 1. And that gives us positivity of the terms, and therefore that they're all non-zero when we add them together. Any questions on this? OK. Uh, we won't dwell on this one, but just a kind of cute comparison result. So it turns out that e mu n has I like to say it has fewer terms than the corresponding McDonald polynomial. We can just explicitly calculate, because we understand which powers appear, that if m divides n, then the powers of x appearing in e mu m contain the powers of x in e mu n. Uh, Jason, can you, this uh, argument that you just gave, Sure. can you do it so that um, you can figure out what survives in the q equals 0 limit? Oh, I already know what survives in the q equals zero limit. I'll say that in a minute. OK. Other questions? OK. So right, uh, this just sort of gives us some intuition for what these look like. Really, you take the corresponding McDonald polynomial and you drop some of the terms away. I mean, the coefficients will be very different, of course. They'll depend on the metaplectic information. But this shows you sort of what they're shaped like. We'll ignore that proof sketch. Another interesting point is that so far, I've only talked about the analog of the non-symmetric McDonald polynomials. But of course, you can do all of this for the analog of symmetric polynomials. So there's some symmetrized family of SSV polynomials that are not symmetric in the usual sense. Instead, they're symmetric with respect to the chinta gunnels biogroup action, which is the thing that started this whole question. chinta gunnels had some biogroup action. SSV understood it in terms of a HECA algebra action. And that's what gave us these SSV polynomials. So it's not a miracle that this is happening here. It's really by construction. But the point is that if anyone cares about these polynomials, then there's an alcove walk formula for them also. But OK, so now let's address uh, Siddhartha's question. So he wanted to know about limits when q goes to 0 or q goes to infinity. And these are, again, what will give us Whittaker functions. So the point is that gamma can be written as a strictly positive power of q times a bunch of k's and g's with no signs or anything. And that's the only thing in our formula that depends on q. So all I have to do is ask, OK, when q goes to 0 or q goes to infinity, what happens to these expressions in terms of gamma that show up? And well, using your knowledge from you know, elementary calculus with this thing on the left, which shows up whenever there's a negative fold, if q goes to 0, that's 0. And if q goes to infinity, that's negative 1. And similarly, for the expression in terms of gamma that appears for positive folds, it's 1 when q goes to 0 and 0 otherwise. 
So now we can just revisit the formula above and throw away all of those ugly things with gammas in them. They're just zero or plus or minus one. And so for the Q limits, we get the following out of walk formulas. So we get rid of all the gamma stuff. We have a K inverse minus K, or maybe a K minus K inverse, depending on the signs, to the number of folds. This product doesn't go away, unfortunately, but that's good because that's where all the Gs live. And the interesting thing is that now our sum for the zero limit is over all the alcove walks that only allow positive folds. Or in the infinity limit, the alcove walks that only allow negative folds. And the reason for that is just what I was writing up here. right? In the Q goes to zero limit, all the negative folds are going to give you a zero. So all that comes up are the ones that only had positive folds in them. So we can explicitly write down this, this very simple formula in terms of alcove walks for the, the Q limit. Any questions? Jason, are, are you just being nice to us by only going type A today? Is everything type independent secretly and I could use these same formulas for everything? So technically, uh, the uh, Sahi, Stokman, and then Kateshwaran only defined the polynomials in type A. But yes, honestly, everything should work just the same. I haven't checked every detail in the other types, but, but yes, you should be able to do all of this in every type. Yeah, so we have, um, <laughs> I guess, a long, long promised paper SSV2, mm -hmm. which is supposed to do everything in complete generality. And uh, it's, um, it's about, uh, I think, 80 pages, maybe, maybe about 70, 75 pages, and it's written, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll get it out. Uh, you know, uh, th things happen. I mean, li life intervened. <laughs> right. But it's, yeah. it's done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but before I even proved this result, they were telling me SSV2 will be out any day. And so, but I ended up doing this in type A generality because it, it wasn't here yet. But yes, something like this should work in any case. OK, that's fantastic. <laughs> Any other questions? I have questions, but should I wait till the end? Uh, if they're more general, yes. OK, so, so why don't you go ahead? OK, uh, just because maybe I'll answer it when I mention the connection with Whittaker functions. Right. Uh, but OK, so let's get there. So the, the last thing that will give us this connection, and you could have proven this without the alcove walk formula, but it's easy to see from my perspective, is that if mu is dominant and we take a Q goes to zero limit of E mu, we just get a monomial. Or conversely, if it's anti-dominant, then the infinity limit is the one that's a monomial. And this should sound familiar to the Whittaker function people. But uh, in this case, the proof is very simple. So if you have an alcove walk to some dominant mu, you just show that when you try to fold the first time, it has to be negative. Uh, and if you draw the pictures, it's not too hard to figure out why this is the case. But because of this, the first fold's negative, but all the negative fold terms die. So there's the only option is the walk with no folds at all. That goes straight to x to the mu. And so this is how we get the base case of the recursion that shows up for Whittaker functions. OK, so now let me say something about that. So let's talk about SSV polynomials and the averaged metaplectic Iwahori Whittaker function. And as I've mentioned before, all the notation is in the recent paper of Brubaker, Bushumis, Bump, and Dusasen. So I'm going to follow their notation. So I'll use this phi sub sigma w of x var pi to the minus lambda w prime. Uh, this sigma is just sitting here. It's just telling me that I'm working with the averaged function. It's shaming me for not getting the, the more general things. But really, you can recover those from the averaged ones anyway. And so what I want to show you is that if I take w prime to be 1, then I can write this in terms of an SSV polynomial. And here's the result I stated above for just the q goes to infinity limit. 
So what we'll do is we'll just compare the recursions. So first on the left, on the Whitaker side, we know that if W is one, then we just get the monomial X to the lambda. On the SSV side, by the corollary I just wrote down, this Q limit is also a monomial. And there's an X inverse, so the, the sign is flipped, but th this is what happens. So lambda plus rho is dominant. So minus it is anti-dominant, which is why it's the Q goes to infinity limit. That's the one we understand. And so when you calculate all this out, you'll see it's the same base case, X lambda. And then for each one, we have a very similar recursion. So uh, this is my rewriting of the math BBT that appears in the paper of BBBG. So if SIW is greater than W, you can connect the Whittaker function at SIW to the Whittaker function at W using this operator up to a scalar, which I'm not going to write down here. But similarly, coming from the double affine Hecke algebra in the paper of SSV, we get this recursion which doesn't care about whether you're greater or smaller, but it'll relate SI mu to mu. And the observation that ties these two families together is that if you're applying it to a suitable function, and this word suitable is doing all the heavy lifting here, so it applied to a suitable F, this TI is going to act the same as some conjugated version of the tau i in the q goes to infinity limit. This actually is not, oh, and this iota map is the map that inverts x. And there's, there's nothing fancy happening here. We're just applying the above and explicitly writing down all the formulas for the ti actions and seeing what happens. And if you do all the bookkeeping, this is the correspondence you'll get. So now we just notice that these recursions match up. You apply this TI to the right-hand side, this SSV polynomial thing. You uh, use it to write it in terms of the tau. Cancel the rows and invert the X. And you're here. And because I've inverted the X and everything, I'm now in the perfect spot to apply the intertwiner. So this simplifies to this. And that, then I invert it back. And this is exactly what it should be. So we started here and we ended here. And what I did is I changed that W to an SIW. So just matching up the recursions, and doing a bunch of bookkeeping, that's it. You can see that these two families of polynomials have to be the same. And you can do a similar sort of thing for the zero limit. Uh, there's a W zero that appears here and it relates to this one. Now, at some point there was a choice of an element of the, um, uh, the N alcove. Where is that in, 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 in this? Um... You, sure. So you're saying like my, my choice of reduced expression for the W that takes like some lambda to mu? Um, uh, well, let's see. To, to, um, there was some discussion. Uh, uh, you were asked, um, does this generalize the ram yip formula? And, and the, the point mm -hmm. was that you, you have a choice of an element of the NL code. And and uh, equals one. That, that's hmm. the wild code. So where is where is that choice in in this? Oh sure. So so maybe I phrased that badly. So what I meant is I'm able to get more polynomials because I broadened what my base case was. But so for like if you hand me some mu, uh, I'll still like I have no choice. Like given some like if you give me like you know one zero minus one, like I have no choice but to write this as uh, as zero times zero, zero, zero. But um, what they wouldn't have done 
is also considered something like this which could instead get me an element like. So I thought that it was, oh, mute, that was supposed work. to be uh, supposed to be in the in the NL code. And then uh, when you uh, I, I, um, um, uh, I, I realized that that was not what you meant when you said that mu that, that mu being dominant was a special case because everything in the NL code would be done, right? Hmm. Yeah, maybe I just I flipped you around with the notation. So I I pick any mu that's a weight, and then Jason, I yeah. So, so Jason, I'm I'm just saying that in the Q goes to zero limit, uh, everything in the dominant chamber is a monomial. But when you have a Q present, only things in the fundamental N alcove are monomials. Okay. That's true. So and now he's looking at the Q goes to uh, zero limit or the Q goes to infinity limit. So then uh, there are just monomials everywhere. And then, um, okay. yeah. mm -hmm. perhaps yeah. that. And in case that wasn't your issue, just to clarify the notation. So, so mu was arbitrary and we were picking lambda in the fundamental alcove. Uh, lambda in the fundamental alcove. Yeah, okay. and W that takes lambda to mu. So lambda is the, the fundamental one. Mu is whatever you chose. Ah, uh, OK. So lambda is in the fundamental alcove. And then you, you um, uh... But uh, wait, so I should apologize for my notation in this section, because here, lambda was any dominant thing. Yes. So maybe I should have called that something else. But so let me scroll up really quick. So yeah. here this formula for uh, Whittaker functions and SSVs, this holds for any dominant lambda. But so, so really, I should have just called it something else, call it new instead. I'm not I'm implying any association with the other one. Uh, OK. Uh, are, are we OK? Did I explain your issue? Uh, no, you didn't, but that's okay. okay. I'll, I'll look at I'll look, I'll look at the uh, uh, paper. Um. Okay, yeah, or I can try to address it more in a minute. Uh, I think that's about all I wanted to say. Anyway, I just wanted to conclude by bringing up a few questions that maybe you all can answer for me. So first, uh, we have these alcove walk formulas for the q goes to zero and infinity limit. I just showed you how to relate them to Whittaker functions. Is this new about Whittaker functions? Or is this something you already know about? I'd, I'd love to hear that. I think it's uh, probably new. That'd be great. Uh, the other thing is uh, the thing that prompts this whole discussion. Is there a solvable lattice model for SSVs? Right? McDonald's have them. Whittaker functions have them. Can you lift it? And also, what this is less for the solvable lattice model seminar. But what else do these polynomials mean? McDonald polynomials have all these interpretations. What can we do with SSVs? Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Jason.